Well, welcome everyone here. We have three fabulous speakers for organic land management, practical tools and techniques. And our first speaker will be Colleen Lokovich, program manager at Oregon Tilt, and she brings education and practical experience to the table. She has a bachelor's of science degree from Purdue University in public horticulture and over 15 years of experience working in different public gardens in the United States and abroad. Her passion is urban and sustainable gardening with a focus on native plants. Most recently, Ms. Lakovich served as the director of the Lurie Garden in Chicago's Millennium Park and completed a year-long horticultural fellowship in Great Britain. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you. Okay, so we have, oh, let me just set this up as slideshow here. Okay, so thank you for uh, being here and attending this fabulous con conference. And I think I have, a, I have 25 minutes today to talk. And we have our other panelists here, so we wanna make sure everyone has their time. So let's get started. So yes, yeah, so I work with Oregon Tilf. This is my contact information. And I'm happy to talk to people afterwards and share this with you later on too. So Oregon Tilf, my job for the next 20, 25 minutes is to provide an overview of what we do and how we're trying to implement change in the community, regionally, as well as nationally. So my talk today will be less sort of technical approaches. It's sort of more how we have connected people in the community to start implementing change. So for those of you not familiar, Oregon Tilth is a nonprofit organization and we are actually based in Corvallis, Oregon, but we have offices all over the country, including Mexico. We have 41 uh, employees. We are known mostly for the certification of organic farms. So you'll see Oregon Tilth mostly in buying a head of lettuce, um, even cotton and clothing could be certified organic by us. But what I'm most proud of are the four things we are committed to, which is education, advocacy, <laughs> certification, and research. As what I really like about Oregon Tilt is our work in advocacy, implementing change, going to DC, working on higher levels for policy change. And a lot of other certifying companies aren't um, out there doing that, so that I'm really proud of that. And we are certified in 47 states. So we're missing, I think it's New Mexico, uh, West Virginia. We can't remember the other one. So organic land care, this is the program that I directly work in. And so I'm one of the co-coordinators of our program. And you'll hear this term organic land care um, used a lot in the next 20 minutes. And so what we try to do is we focus on a comprehensive collection of ideas, ecology, health, both soil, plant, animal, and human, as well as equity, you know, building relationships that are ensuring fairness with regard to the common environment and life opportunities. And this is often linked to um, wages, health on the job, things like that. And then general care, protecting the health and well-being of current and future generations. So the program that I work directly with is what we call our Oregon TILF Accredited Organic Land Care Program. So accredited meaning you are engaged in our program and you actually become an accredited practitioner. And so the OLC program, we basically are here to offer tools and marketing opportunities for landscape professionals working under organic principles. So the goals of our program, teaching sustainable landscaping practices, providing networking opportunities. I think we all have experienced feeling sort of isolated or alone in this career push and having other people to talk to so it can sometimes make or break an experience. And then we obviously we offer the professional accreditation, which I'll go into in the future and um, general public awareness. So those are sort of the angles that we're coming at. 
technically speaking, it's really all about soil, soil, soil. Tilth means soil, cultivating good, healthy soil, maintaining it. Uh, I could talk about plants for a very long time, but proper plant selection is part of organic land care. Controlling, but also tolerating weeds and pests. You know, we, we focus so much on diversity in the garden and um, I feel like that's a great parallel for life in general. Diversity can solve a lot of problems. Uh, conservation, and then developing partnerships. Because the reality is, this is what most of the country is doing. We've all seen this everywhere, all over. We could keep doing that or start working on movements towards this, permeable paving, They've eliminated the lawn, and this is a new planting, but they're, they're using responsible plant choices. I really, during my work, I really try to focus on what inspires, and when I'm talking to clients or potential landscapers, I really like to use nature as the best example, because really nature knows no waste. And so, in simple terms, I just try to say, you know, we're just trying to replicate what nature does beautifully. And one of the biggest, sort of trickiest items in our program, and probably a lot of uh, my panelists can speak to, is sort of a lot of the greenwashing. You know, there's a tremendous amount of professionals out there, so-called, um, claiming to be green, because in the last 10, 15 years, it's become such a buzzword everywhere you go. And so one thing that we're trying to weed out is sort of the the, the people who are really doing it and the people who aren't. So we have what we call our principles and policies. And I know those are sort of like solid, harsh words, but they've really helped guide our program so that our students and our professionals have some guidance to lead them. And so sort of the, the principles we have is working with natural systems and processes, all about bio biological diversity and native habitats. We're really trying to decrease inputs and optimize all of the properties of soil, air, and water. We spend a lot of time on utilizing renewable, biodegradable, recycled materials, keeping everything on site as much as possible, and considering the wider social and ecological impacts of landscape, practices, and products used for maintenance. So let's talk about one of the biggest challenges we have. Well, organic land care is so much more expensive. I can't do it because of the cost. So I have a feeling Chip can speak more to this with the, the true costs. But in our program, by year three, we've seen that costs have gone down past 25%. And so we really, really try to get sort of the, the brain shifting from a less product base to more of an integrated system. And so, product based, I think we've all experienced going to your local nursery and honest to God, you'll see shelf after shelf of plastic bottles promoting kills this, kills everything, weed and grass killer, and it just goes on and on. And the product base is not, as you all know, addressing anything linked to causes. It's addressing the causes, pardon me, not the symptoms. So they're not getting at the core root of it. And most of the core root of it is truly linked to soil, hands down. If there's anything you're going to do, you're going to work and feed your soil. Another big issue in the landscape industry, over 70% of plants die because of overwatering. Most people overwater. They have their fabulous irrigation system that they switch on in spring and switch off in fall and never think about it again. So, how did we get to this point in Oregon Tilth where we created these policies and standards? We started this about seven years ago through um, a collaboration of different partners to create sort of this standard and definition of what organic land care is. So we have our required, preferred, and prohibited practices. 
We have the Coalition of Landscape Professionals, Horticultural Academia, and we all meet annually to update our recommendations from the Standing Committee. Our two prime collaborators in the early days were NOFA, Northwest Organic Farming Association, and then SOL, Society for Organic Urban Land Care, based in British Columbia. And they are a great organization. They offer a lot of online classes. And we're starting to partner with them to provide more of that for people. So further on mission impact, we have our policies and standards, which are all outlined in our, our sort of field guide binder that all of our students receive. The program provides for a consistent and documented approach. So we do try to focus a lot on actual facts in our program versus sort of philosophical. We, of course, we focus on soil health, water management, air quality, organic, weed, and pest management, and then the entire design, installation, and maintenance aspect. This is a quick overview of some of our required OLC practices. Number one is educating landowners. We have 81 accredited practitioners, and some of the, the biggest challenges they face is convincing that homeowner to make the first step of change. So these accredited practitioners that we train, they're out in the field implementing change and communicating effectively to these people, but they need kind of the tools and resources to do that. Uh, we focus a bit on equipment and tool clean out when you're changing conventional to organic, just like you would with an organic farm. Record keeping and agreements. You know, this is what keeps our, our program with a high level of policies and standards. We do hold people accountable for their business models, their policies, and their actions. They don't just take our class and off they go. And, of course, the soil tests. The soil food web is all related. So to begin our organic land care program with a client, a professional business, the soil test is number one. We, we cover water conservation. You have to grow organically grown seeds by plants organically if plant stock is not available. And um, least impact practices overall. So this is also kind of interesting. These are all of the items that are completely prohibited. So genetically modified organisms, GMOs, so buying plant material from GOM seed using PVC-based plastic mulches except for solarization. Obviously in sort of the Willamette Valley, you, do see, you see some solarization, but not that much. Raw manure on plants, uh, burning, that is not allowed except for invasive noxious weed control, and two cycle gasoline powered equipment. If it was up to me, I would try to eliminate all leaf blowers like that because of their noise pollution and the carbon footprint. In fact, the uh, Soul Group up in Canada, they actually have outlawed leaf blowers um, in their program, which I think is tremendous. So how do we do all of this? We've been fortunate through the years um, to build very significant partners. And um, this is one of my favorite parts about the job, is getting out in the field, talking and seeing what different public and private companies and universities are doing, as well as municipalities. So we do work with quite a few private universities locally, George Fox, Lewis and Clark, Reed College, Willamette University. We have one botanical garden, Japanese gardens here. We work with, excuse me, the Oregon Green Schools, a um, couple different municipalities, Portland, Lake Oswego, Gresham. The list keeps growing. And this past year, we received funding to um, provide more outreach and technical trainings to these groups. So we're really excited about that. So our program is growing uh, staff-wise as well as programmatically. So one of our favorite partners that I'll spend a couple minutes talking about is our work with Willamette University. And they're a private college based in Salem. And they actually have sites on campus that are organically zoned um, organic. So that means the entire garden there is organically managed. 
This is a pretty crazy list of all of different chemicals, pesticides, and herbicides they used prior to starting shifting their agenda in 2004. They were pretty old school in their thinking and based completely on a spray, spray, spray mentality. So the reality is they ended up, they were tired. They, the groundskeepers were just simply tired of spraying and they started to learn more about the negative effects and um, they just did it. They actually didn't get um, permission from the administration. administrative. They slowly started integrating this into their plan and then they kept fabulous records to prove the financial benefit. And they were able to save close to 40% in their costs. Their biggest um, issue is, was a little bit more of labor, but because they weren't spending tremendous amounts of money on chemicals and pesticides, their budget dropped dramatically. They maintained a relatively similar aesthetic. People were happy. So that was one approach that worked really well. Kind of just starting, don't tell many people, and do it. <laughs> um, one thing they also do is work on invasive weed removal. And ivy is a noxious and invasive weed in most parts of the country. And um, it's planted a lot because it holds erosion, keeps the soil in. It also uh, has absolutely zero ecological benefit. And so they worked at uh, removing it by hand on this slope. And uh, their groundskeepers worked on selecting plant material that seeded uh, pretty freely. A lot of it was native. A lot of it, their, their sort of main priorities were pollinator habitat as well as drought tolerant in the summer. So this was a couple of years ago. The planting design keeps evolving. And Dean, whoops, let me go back. Dean, the head uh, groundskeeper there, if you ever have the opportunity to talk to him, he's fabulous. So they, they worked with a tremendous amount of native plant material as well. We work with some pretty high-end landscape companies. And so um, I'm really proud to work with Willamette Landscapes, and they're doing a good amount of organic lawn. And something we've learned in our education with organic lawn is to have the lawn be sort of a blank canvas. If there's, if there's, if there's weeds and um, clover over the entire lawn, it's going to get more accepted visually versus a patch here and a patch there. People, especially in America, like this consistent look. And this is what it looks up close up, looks like close up. So Chip will talk more um, about probably aspects like this, but the turf is one of the biggest questions we get. How can I do organic turf? This is an eco lawn in a uh, suburb outside of Portland. And this is an organic, organically managed lawn as well. And they're using all electric equipment. Pacific Landscape Management is another company that we use a, a lot. And these are all their techniques for weeding. They also, instead of spraying grass for removal with Roundup or such, they are act actively implementing sheet mulching into their uh, sites. So plant selection is a big part of it. Um, native plants, we try to enforce as much as we can. Not all native plants work in the home environment. And so really, we like to talk more about well-suited plants. What else are they doing? Are they attracting pollinators? Are they drought tolerant? So that's a really interesting topic and sort of a, miss, a weak link in the program for the landscape professionals because they're very used to just going to the nursery. Oh my gosh, it's 10 o'clock. I have to install by 3. I need 25 of this, 50 of this. So trying to get away from that philosophy. So our accreditor practitioners are accredited. They're not certified like our organic farms. And our sites are not certified they're accredited. So that's sort of the difference we always like to. So how do you get accredited? You attend, attend a five-day training. You have to take an exam. You have to agree to our policies and complete required professional agreement. And you have to renew. The biggest, uh, one of our largest sort of focuses right now is helping our landscape professionals 
market themselves. They had taken the initiative to do all this work and training. So how do we market? They, they get to use our logo, which is already a, a pretty significant brand in the field. And you'll see here, some are putting them right on their trucks, on their business cards, on their websites. And this is something that I'm new to the program, but I'm trying to work a little bit more about is how to help these people work it into their sales pitch. We also focus a lot on factual angles for approach when we're dealing with new clients. Most people don't want to hear the negative, threatening stories. So, but if you can provide factual scientific backup, people seem to respond a little bit more to that. Specifically related to health. So we're working with Oregon Green Schools, NCAP, and we're, we're actually going directly to the parents um, instead of the administrators. And another growth in our program is we're working directly with Spanish-speaking professionals and employees at institutions and businesses because they're often the ones out in the field and focusing on health re related to that because so much of what you're applying you are bringing home with you and the residual is significant. So in summary, um, the reality is that everyone has a landscape and focusing on the sustainable is the best place to start. And this is sort of my plug, you know, I think we need to get out there and start speaking and focusing a little bit more on the non-believers to implement change, the skeptics, the Big Ten schools. I went to Purdue, organic was never ever a word talked about in um, the late 1990s. Start looking at public places, aside from just parks and schools, like botanic gardens. People go to botanic gardens to learn for inspiration, and ironically, they are not very green. Except the Lurie Garden, where I worked, we, abs we used absolutely zip, zero, anything. We uh, didn't even use mulch. We kept the plant material on site. Most of the plants are native to the Midwest. So that is a perfect sample of a high profile place. Millions of people go there every day. So how do we tie our program together? We do it with peer learning groups, technical assistance trainings, social gather gatherings. We focus on building a network of community. And these are our next trainings. Uh, this fall in Seattle in the Olympia area and then coming January in Portland. All of this is on our website as well. Thank you. Sourcing native plant or um, yeah, organic seeds and, and plant. <laughs> In this area, it's not that difficult. You know, we're, we're pretty blessed with our, our options here. Yeah. I think it gets trickier in other places. You know, um, it ha the thing is, it takes it takes a little bit more effort, but we haven't had anyone really have issues with that. So, and I mean, I'm from the Midwest. I think they have a harder time than here. Yeah. Quick question, how do you deal in uh, your standards of the program with, uh, like all grass seed is now pre-treated with fungicides and all sod is conventionally grown? So when either treated grass seed or mm -hmm. sod is used in a, you know, by an accredited professional in a landscape, how do you deal with that? So it's typically a three-year transitional process. So ship's right, the sod grown on all these sod farms is conventionally grown. <laughs> And so it's just, a, it's a transitional process. So you start working at building the soil, getting the deeper roots, and then letting it do its thing. Great, and one more question. Um, maybe part of the program with response to the seeds is actually growing or teaching how to grow from seeds, organic seeds, or having those accredited people selling them, right? Like who sells organic seeds. But my question is, you said accredited in 47 states or something like that. What accredited? 
So a credit is where you take our training and you abide by our policies and standards and actively, oh, states. because they come and they take, when I say um, 47 states, we have accredited practitioners in 47 states. Definitely significant clarification there, thank you. Okay, thank right. you very much, Colleen. And thank you for doing this really important work and providing, providing this uh, to the community and to the whole country. It's so important. Next, we're gonna have Melissa Melko. And we were honored yesterday to get to go on a tour to her home. And it is the most beautiful, magical, special place and it was so wonderful to get to go there and walk through her gardens and her backyard and and I really applaud her for what she has done there. Um, she is a landscape designer, horticulturist, and member of Sustainable Overlook, a neighborhood program which aims to raise awareness about the importance of protecting health, water, and habitat for pollinators, wildlife, and human inhabitants. Ms. Melko is leading the group's efforts to become the first pesticide-free Portland neighborhood, creating gardening program, a bee-friendly a bee -friendly garden tour, and classes for organic landscape design. She holds a degree from Permaculture Institute and the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. I am really excited to be here, and the tour yesterday was, was really exciting. How many of you were able to go on it? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, I was so honored. That there was some amazing people in my yard yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> some of my heroes. Um, so when I first had the idea of creating a pesticide-free neighborhood, it was, it was just a, a wish, kind of a, a wistful wish. And I'm here to tell you about how our neighborhood group is making it a reality, but first I'm gonna share with you why I embarked on starting the project. So a few years ago, <clears throat> I quit my job as a landscape designer at a, a landscaping company and a garden center that was pretty typical. Um, like Colleen's slide with all of the bottles of chemicals showed, um, they were selling a lot of herbicides and pesticides and trading in plants laced with neonics. Um, and using plenty of chemicals on site, despite um, trying to garner green credibility. And I had been working in the horticulture industry for almost 20 years, and um, like you knew how ubiquitous many of the landscaping chemicals are and how casually they're often used. And I also knew enough about the threats that they pose um, to our health and the environment. And I was really frustrated at the pace of change and the nonchalance regarding pesticide exposure. Um, I, so I was ready to move on from my job. I was ready to have a child, and I knew I wouldn't be comfortable with the exposure risk in that workplace. Um, and I could tell you a lot of stories about what I've seen, but that's not what I'm going to tell you today. <coughs> so. Um, during pregnancy, my main form of exercise was walking around my neighborhood. And I live in North Portland. Um, and I, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a beautiful neighborhood that overlooks the Willamette River. Um, <clears throat> I, I noticed a lot of signs of chemical use. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you this because when we start our neighborhood project, we're going to be inspired by permaculture principles, and the first principle is observation, um, using thoughtful and protracted observation of a site before um, jumping in and taking action, making a plan. Um, so things were, were percolating in my mind. I was walking around and noticing chemical containers left out in yards, strong smelling granular products that were overspread onto the sidewalk, into the street, washing down into the sewer that goes to the river. 
um, seen areas that had been sprayed. Um, and I, I, I kept thinking about Sandra Steingraber's book, Having Faith, An Ecologist's Journey to Motherhood, um, with its poetic yet scientific descriptions of embryo development and how toxins can cause it to go wrong. I thought a lot about how the world would be different if it were guided by the precautionary principle. So I started seeing the neighborhood kind of like this. <laughs> not, not black and white, but kind of, um, kind of in a scary way. I, I had a, a really healthy pregnancy, um, but our son was born with some really serious complications at birth, and life became really stressful and scary. Um, and as spring arrived, he was, he was born in the end of December, and, and those first few months were really tough. And spring came, and we started to be able to be outside with him more. And being in the garden um, at the hospital where they have healing gardens or at our home was really a source of solace. And walking around the neighborhood and looking at all the spring bulbs blooming and the flowering trees should have brought a lot of joy, but I kept noticing the chemical use and I knew that those products are linked to cancer and developmental delays and all the things you've been hearing about um, in the conference so far and, and how these things are especially risks to babies and children. So I had to just live with my anxiety about it at that point. But as my son's second spring came, he was walking we started walking around the neighborhood. Um, he was so delighted to toddle down the sidewalk and I wanted to really encourage his explorations and I sometimes had to stop him. I swoop down and pick him up because I noticed there's casserole pebbles all over the sidewalk or there's um, a puddle on a, the first sunny day and he wants to stomp in it and it's irrigation runoff from a yard with a Camelon sign posted. There's no way to explain this seemingly irrational behavior to a one-year-old. Like, no, you can't play in that yard. It's, it's yucky. Um, I wanted him to feel that the world made sense, and I wanted him to see it as interesting and beautiful. Uh, and I knew it could be years before I could have a conversation about any of these issues with what was happening. And, and when I can do that, I hope things will have changed a lot. Um, and I, I kept thinking about another... Um, quote from Sandra Steingraber from her newer book, Raising Elijah. Um, it, this quote stayed in my head. In the absence of federal policies that are protective of child development and the ecology of the planet on which our children's lives depend, we serve as our own regulatory agencies and departments of the interior. Thoughtful but overwhelmed parents correctly perceive a disconnect between the enormity of the problem and the ability of indiv individual acts of vigilance and self-sacrifice to fix it. Environmental awareness without corresponding political changes leads to paralyzing despair. We feel helpless in our knowledge. We're not sure we want any more knowledge. You could call this well-informed futility syndrome. As soon and soon enough, we're retreating into silent resignation rather than standing up for abolition now. And then last spring, I read an article in the Oregonian about the American Academy of Pediatrics statement um, that said you shouldn't use pesticides around children. The one that was um, authored by um, our speaker this morning, Dr. James Roberts. And so I was carrying this newspaper article around with me. It talked about, it says, is your garden a poison playground? It talked about pesticide exposure risks to children and how pediatricians need to reach out to parents. And then the companion piece was about Metro, our regional government, having a natural gardening program and having a healthy lawn and garden pledge. And I had seen those ladybug signs around. Um, and so I started to get an idea. I had a lot of anger and frustration and despair over the issue, um, but I also, I had this, I felt compelled at that point to do something and I had an idea. Um, and I had a lot of questions too. Um, I had heard about municipalities in Canada that had enacted regulations to ban pesticides. I was wondering, are there any in the US? What are, what are they doing in Europe? What's the best level of action? Um, should we put on bee suits and go to the big box store? Should we try to do 
um, push for local regulations or state or should we you know get a big petition going should we do something on change.org um, and what I ended up doing was connecting with people in my neighborhood I was already part of a group called sustainable overlook um, that is a committee of the neighborhood association they have been around for four years it was a group of neighbors um, who got together and they were inspired by the transition movement um, to get together and make a organization that would support neighbors in in doing projects so anybody can bring a project to the group and we'll band together to help make it a reality and the goal is to foster resilience and um, build community just encourage people to take steps toward sustainable living um, so I shared my vision with them of creating a safer and healthier neighborhood by inviting our 2,500 neighboring households to go pesticide free um, this transition model that we were inspired by uh, is about choosing to work locally as opposed to calling for bans or boycotts it's about making positive practical action to to work work to be more resilient in the face of climate change and peak oil and economic crisis um, and and it acknowledges how related those three things are um, and it's also about having fun so this is one of our events that we've done in conjunction with the village building convergence it's a intersection repair where there was a big mural um, created that had to do with some symbols from the neighborhood um, and um, there was a big party with a lot of groups that came and painted it and and it's become an annual tradition and and it's going to be on May 31st if you'd like to join us this year um, so and then I mentioned we're inspired by permaculture as well which is a set of design principles that can help realign the relationship between people and in the environment in ways that produce abundance the main idea is to model our communities and gardens and farms and our built environment on natural ecosystems like what Colleen was saying about the thrust of the uh, organic certification is to look at nature as a model so to get our project started instead of starting from scratch um, we asked um, the head of Metro's sustainability center Carl Grimm if we could partner with them and oops um, and use the ladybug logo uh, the national group um, that I think is based in Marin County um, the pesticide free zone um, created this um, really recognizable logo and we asked them for permission to use it and um, and Metro was extremely supportive in letting us um, take their healthy lawn and garden pledge program and bring it in a really concentrated way to our neighborhood um, and this was great because um, starting up a new project like this um, it gave us some credibility and um, a whole bunch of resources to work with and I reached out to Beyond Pesticides and to NCAP um, kind of for moral support and they were able to point me toward a lot of resources that they had their really great literature and website um, that we could use in our campaign um, and we assembled our team so we had the core group of sustainable overlook volunteers and um, we started reaching out and partnering and discovered there's amazing people in our neighborhood there's a conservation bio biologist from Xerxes one of Mace Vaughn's um, colleagues who you met last night um, the charter school was on board we have um, the manager of the backyard habitat certification program in our neighborhood um, and she lent her support and then um, friends of Overlook Bluff is trying to restore some of the white oak habitat along the Willamette Valley Bluff that is between our residential part of our neighborhood and the big industrial area that is technically part of our neighborhood um, and so these folks have all helped us with resources and helped us spread the word about the project um, and there's been so many different reasons why people are excited about this um, the big one of course is human health and concerned about children's health um, but there's a lot of people in our neighborhood growing their own food and they are really concerned about food safety and food security in terms of um, resilience 
Um, in fact, Multnomah County's Health and Human Services Emergency Manager is one of our core supporters, and so she's thinking about um, being pesticide free as a form of resilience for emergency management. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of people doing habitat gardening and concerned about wildlife and also pet safety. Um, so <coughs> we um, got the support of the Neighborhood Association, and then we s just kind of got started. We, um, before we were really too ready, we started getting some media coverage. Like, there's this woman in North Portland who's going to make her neighborhood pesticide free. <laughs> and <laughs> so we had to kind of scramble to get organized. Um, we have a map maker on our team. Um, this doesn't represent all the green properties, about half of them who have pledged so far um, in our neighborhood are on there. Um, and we started doing tabling events at all the community um, the fairs and the parties in the park and sometimes we dressed as bees. <laughs> um, we hold monthly gardening classes that are a really powerful tool. They're free and they're held every month on a different topic um, and we want to change people's attitudes about what the norm of land care is. and. Um, so this hands-on experience with nature and talking with neighbors and getting excited about growing your own food, I think that's the kind of thing that can have more impact than the misleading marketing and myths that we're up against. And if people feel really strongly about chemical use in their own yard, they are more likely to stand up and demand pesticide-free and not GM food, um, which in Oregon is something that we need to work hard on now. And um, yeah, we're trying to kind of create a new culture in our neighborhood of thoughtful lane care and thoughtful living. So, and we have small volunteers too. Sometimes we dress them as ladybugs. Um, so next I'm gonna show you a little news clip about the project. Inspired by the birth of her son, a Portland mom wants to make her entire neighborhood pesticide free. That's a tall order considering there are more than 2,000 homes there. News Channel 8's Kathy Marshall introduces us now to this young mom on a mission. Well, Reggie, she certainly has all the tools to do it beyond your basic shovel and bucket. Melissa Melko is actually a landscape designer who has plenty of tricks uh, for dealing with pests the natural way. Yeah, more berries. Berries. <laughs> One year old Rowan uses sign language. Let's get some berries. Telling mom more raspberries. Mm. Here's some more. Here. No rinsing necessary, says mom, because she never uses pesticides. Totally pesticide free. Melissa Melko is asking her entire Overlook neighborhood in North Portland to do the same. All of these little critters that live on all of our plants are normal and natural, and um, the secret is just helping them stay balanced. Metro's Healthy Lawn and Garden Pledge is what Melissa uses to deliver her message. Neighbors can pledge to reduce or stop using pesticides. They'll get a ladybug yard sign for making the commitment. People are really enthusiastic. People in other neighborhoods are saying, I wish that this was happening in our neighborhood. And we say, well, we hope it does. And Melissa uh, points to an American Academy of Pediatrics report linking pesticide exposure with pediatric <laughs> cancers, decreased cognitive function, and behavioral problems. The Academy recommended pediatricians ask parents about pesticides use and advise them to choose the lowest harm approach when considering pest control. We are trying to grow 70% of our own produce here. There's a lot of flowers for beneficial insects and onions, eggplants. And Melissa carrots, grows beans, kale, potatoes and plenty of other produce. And then on the edges we have perennials. And she does get pests. So I have aphids and slugs and rust fungus. I'm growing a lot of edible flowers like nasturtiums and plants for beneficial insects to help control the pest naturally. Flowers on her cilantro attract wasps that eat the eggs of aphids. Marigolds are another must. And then the roots below ground um, are said to repel nematodes which can eat your plant's roots. 
Healthy plants without mm. pesticides yeah. begin, she says, with the soil. It's why she composts. Weeds and plants that I've cut off. And In just 10 days, 200 of Melissa's neighbors have taken the Metro Healthy Lawn and Garden Pledge. And with 2,300 more homes to go, she's keeping her request simple. Get your hands dirty and try it and, um, you know, see what happens. <laughs> Later this summer, Melissa will be offering a natural gardening class. It's free, and you can tell she's well qualified to teach it. We'll have details on that at KGW.com, as well as details on how you can take that healthy lawn and garden pledge. A mouthful there. And Reggie and Steph, I have to mention, when I came up to the roof to do this live shot, there was a ladybug up here to greet me, which <laughs> Melissa says is one of the best things you can have in your garden. There you go. It must be a sign. Kathy. Of course, she flew away home well, after yeah. I told her to. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, Thank Kathy. You. High temperatures are on the all right. Sorry, that video was choppy. <coughs> was last June. And then they did a follow up. Um, they came to my house again and, and filmed, and I actually kind of thought it was a different TV station, and I was really excited. And then I realized that they were going to report on the story, and they didn't realize they had already reported on the story. But they did a follow up story. <laughs> So those are all on our website, and all of the resources that I'm mentioning really quickly are on our website, sustainableoverlook.org, too, and all the other press. We were written up in a, um, a journal of health care for a um, health advocacy group, um, which was another exciting thing that happened early on. Um, yeah, so our gardening classes and... Um, then another way that we're, we're getting the word out is our garden tour. Last year was the second year of um, the tour, and we decided to connect it to the Pesticide Free Neighborhood Project by making that the theme. And we had eight gardens that were all pesticide free, all different styles. Some of them are really wild and natural, um, like Allison's garden that you saw yesterday, and then some of them are um, pretty traditional looking, kind of everything in between. Um, with kind of heavy em <coughs> emphasis on edible landscaping. We're gonna do the tour again this year. It was a big success last year. We um, had over 150 people come. Um, and yeah, this year it's gonna have 10 gardens and we're gonna have booths from our partners so people can learn about um, pollinator <laughs> conservation and organic yard care and all kinds of things. So some of the Oh, and then there's some more pictures of, um, we made this beautiful tour booklet that told the stories of all of the gardens and how the gardener became pesticide free and what their best tips were and their favorite resources. And then I realized they were too expensive to print them. So <laughs> the little things that you learn along the way, we're going to have a simpler brochure for the tour this year. Um, and we made these cute signs that talked about the natural gardening tips and pointed out the plants that people liked. If you didn't make it on the tour yesterday, this is Allison's garden in the summer. It's pretty gorgeous. And this is my backyard. That's a few years ago. And she has chickens and ducks. <laughs> Um, and then this is a garden nearby. This is actually the, um, the disaster manager's garden, and she does some crazy great permaculture. Uh, um, she's a food, not lawns advocate, and her whole front yard is edible and beautiful, and she has annexed the parking strips of five neighbors, so it's like they have a farm on their street. So come on the tour and see this stuff, because it's really cool. And, and they don't just have the parking strips all garden, they have a meal together every week. And so they're, they're really, have formed this great community. My son loves to go, this is a block away from us, he loves to go over there because always somebody outside that he can talk to. <laughs> um, and there's honeybees on the tour. Um, so challenges, this is a couple weeks ago at the park by our house. Um, and this is so common, we've got five city parks in Overlook and um, they're all managed by IPM. However, the strategy includes routine use of Roundup and other herbicides, and um, so that's something that we are starting to work on, and um, we've got, um, we've done some canvassing. Volunteers 
have not been super enthusiastic about it. So that's a challenge. If anybody here has experience with that, I want to talk. Um, because it's a really good way to, to get one-on-one -on -one with people and, and get them the resources they need in their hands. Um, and yeah, join us for our events. Um, so this project is a really small thing. We're just one of 90 neighborhoods in Portland alone, but it feels better to do something than to just be frustrated. Um, it's a path toward healing the land and the community. And um, yeah, it's a way for me personally to seek balancing, working for change with, enjoying life, and knowing you are all out there. Everybody at this conference this weekend, um, that you're all out there working hard makes me grateful and hopeful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. And again, the <coughs> tour of your place yesterday was just spectacular. And it's so important that we have all of us working at our levels that we do, uh, choline or accrediting and training and teaching the people, Melissa on the ground, the leader in the neighborhood, and how to get the information out. And that was fabulous media that you have. And congratulations. It's just really cool. And I, I see Col Colleen's pregnant, so they're going to be training their children, so we'll already have disciples in place, and that's really cool. Our next speaker is Chip Osborne, a dear friend of mine, and he's on the board of Beyond Pesticides. And he is the founder and president of Osborne Organics. I should change this to to yours. Maybe I, maybe I better not touch it. <laughs> um, um, founder and president of Osborne Organics from Marblehead, Massachusetts. He has over 10 years of experience in creating safe and sustainable and healthy athletic fields and landscapes and 35 years experience as a professional horticulturist. As a wholesale and retail nurseryman, he has had first-hand experience with the pesticides routinely used in the landscape industry. Personal experience led him to believe that there must be a safer way to grow plants. His personal investigation and study of conventional and organic soil science practices and hands-on experimentation led him to become one of the country's leading experts on growing organic turf. Chip, welcome. Just slow. Okay. And Chip goes all over the country helping people get set up without chemicals. He's a great teacher and helper and mentor. So I'm going to set my timer here because normally I talk from between two and eight hours at a time. <laughs> so I can take 20 minutes just to say good morning. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, we, we don't want that to happen. So what we're going to talk a little bit about here today is to try to tie this all together into the, the practical application side or looking at, uh, you know, sort of where we are at this point in time in the industry, where we are uh, out here in the real world, you know, trying to respond. In other words, so what uh, Melissa is doing, what Colleen and Oregon Tilt are doing, it's solution oriented and that's really where we need to go. We've identified the problems and now we have to find the solutions. In land management, there is no use for integrated pest management. IPM is considered structural nowadays only. Uh, there, integrated pest management does not fit in with our goals here in organic land care. Uh, I've uh, defined and coined the term organic IPM, 
which uh, creates some of the same protocols, but it's based on cultural practices and sound land management. And if and when we need to intervene at the end uh, with a product, it's a 25B exempted product. In other words, we're very, very tight on what can happen. So very uh, low tolerance for any, uh, you know, any pesticide pressures. Uh, as Lottie said, my background, it's, it's actually, that's an old bio, it's 40 years now, I'm, I'm kind of getting to be an old man, uh, and 40 years as a horticulturist, and I would cut my teeth in the early 70s with all kinds of pesticides. I bought, mixed, and sprayed more pounds than most land care practitioners will in a lifetime. So it, it, things happened, uh, and then I decided I needed to try to find a better way to do things. Um, American homeowners account for 80 million, 80 million pounds of toxic pesticides applied year after year in pursuit of the perfect lawn. Uh, 32 million acres of lawn in North America, $750 million spent on grass seed alone, 30 billion spent on do-it-yourself lawn care. It is a big industry. It is big business. So when people want to use insecticides, uh, fungicides, herbicides, those pesticides that are used in lawn care, that industry was developed for one reason and one reason only, to generate revenue. It's no secret. The four-step program could care less whether you grow a nice lawn or not. They want revenue in their pocket. There is no use for lawn insect control. Put down an insecticide to kill everything out there, just in case one of the two or three insects that could damage the lawn might be there. I've had the opportunity to sit in legislative testimony right across the table from the company that does the four-step program and confronted him with that fact and they have no answer for that. It is revenue. Um, one of my goals or what I do as a, as a company, I'm no longer uh, a horticulturist. I had a greenhouse nursery garden center business. Uh, that whole industry is heavily chemically pressured. Uh, I got out of that back seven or eight years ago. I now have my own company with a focus on consultation. Uh, as well as, uh, as um, education, because I, I firmly believe the most limiting factor that stands in the more widespread adoption of organic land care practices and principles is simply the lack of education that's out there. And for that, I tip my hat to, you know, to Colleen and what, what Oregon Tilt is doing uh, you know, to bring that into, <clears throat> into reality. Uh, some of the, the projects that I get involved with in the big picture, I don't have a service, I'm not a service provider, don't have a, have a company that does that, but working with the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia as a, as a director of Beyond Pesticides with Lonnie and Terry in the back, uh, we're managing now 11 national parks organically for the federal government because they have decided that the time has come to make those properties safer. Uh, communities like Malibu, California, Durango, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, uh, Chicago Park District, various uh, groups around the country. So this idea of coming from, you know, chemicals to organic is not something that's just happening on those little two, three, five thousand square foot lawns. We're talking big picture now. This is the reality is here that we're at the tip of the iceberg in moving this. We are clearly mainstream, no longer out there on the fringe. <clears throat> Uh, a lot of this began for me back in the 1990s when in my own business, after all this chemical use, I decided that this just wasn't the right way to go. Not only was it not healthy for me as the applicator, but for people that were coming into my establishment. I teamed up with a housewife uh, in my town of Marblehead, Massachusetts, and we became a perfect combination. I was the industry turncoat and she was the mother that had the passion. We formed the Marblehead Pesticide Awareness Committee and, and came up, we coined two uh, phrases, awareness through education, where we in a non-alarmist way raised the issue. And then we came up with simple step to organic lawn care to here is the solution. And uh, it, it just clicked and, and we did that for a number of years. We engaged our local board of health and ended up with an organic pest management policy for all town-owned land. It was the first of its kind in the country, which prohibited the use of all synthetic per products as well as pesticides. Everything that can be used on town-owned land has to be OMRI-approved material or the equivalent, uh, and it has been that way since 2001. All of our athletic fields, all the playing fields, all naturally managed. Um, doesn't matter at this point in time whether everybody agrees about the use of synthetics. The exciting thing is the market is changing. People are beginning to request and look for a non-toxic approach because we now do have viable alternatives to that chemical intensive management. How does the market change? 
Melissa changes the market. Colleen trains the industry to respond to that change. I'm also involved in training. I work with a group in Connecticut called Connecticut NOFA. Uh, you saw their logo, logo up there, the Northeast Organic Farming Association. Since 2000, we have trained 1,500 professionals in organic land care practices. We have a set of standards. We have guidelines uh, very similar to what Oregon Tilt has created. So this is the market change at the grassroots level. Uh, people like Melissa begin to raise the awareness and then uh, they come in with the training. So what is this all about? It's a systems approach versus a product approach. So historically we have ad addressed everything from a quick fix, instant gratification, product centered approach. And organic land care is a systems based approach that involves three distinct concepts. Understanding soil biology, high school, we were taught a handful of soil, billions of organisms. Nature put them there for the specific reason of growing things. We understand that. We work with that. The exclusive use of natural organic products and then revised and very specific horticultural practices. Practices. Soil quality, improving soil health and quality absolutely is our number one goal. Uh, when we're talking about turf management as an aspect of land care, we're looking at soil testing, identifying soil biology, the use of compost teas and other liquid applications that may not necessarily introduce nitrogen, but they address certain specific aspects of that system, kelps and humic acids and remineralization, where we can put nitrogen down now at low doses. I'm doing programs at two-tenths of a pound of nitrogen per application but we're combining it with these other materials that are non-nitrogenous and everything at low dose cumulatively gives a benefit that that four-step program can't even touch. And that's where the excesses are coming there. Natural organic fertilizers, aggressive seeding and overseeding, aeration, dethatching, mowing and irrigation as those cultural practices. Conventional management treats symptoms. Natural organic solves problems. So pesticides do not grow grass or any other plant in the landscape. They only take something out of there that we determine is uh, not necessary uh, or not desired. We need to rethink what we call a weed. Weed has been defined by an industry in 1950. When all these products came out of World War II and they marketed them to agriculture and then moved it into residential, into the homeowner sector, and all of a sudden clover, one of the most valuable plants in nature, has been branded this ugly weed and you have to buy my chemical to get rid of it. Just so happened that same industry had a product over here to give you all the nitrogen you just lost when you <laughs> killed that weed. That didn't happen by accident. Synthetic fertilizers create a dependence upon synthetic control product. It was designed that way from the beginning, and we were a gullible audience in the 50s, 60s, 70s able to do that. It just so happened I was in my hotel room, uh, you know, coming in, and they had some clips from the Masters Golf Tournament. April 1967, first time the Masters was shown on color TV. And all the men said, that's what my lawn's going to look like. And an industry was ready to give it to them the next weekend. And that's where, you know, that's sort of where we are. So very important concept that pesticides never, ever solve a problem. Because if you go into a lawn and you kill a weed, what's most likely to grow back there? It's just going to be another weed unless you put a grass seed down there to take its place. Two different ways that we can approach this type of a management. We can create an organic program for land care management, including allowed materials, and Oregon Tilt and Connecticut NOFA have allowed materials, or we can manage without pesticides. I choose the second option. I manage without. There is something called a rescue treatment, and if, my, if something in that system goes out of whack that I need to intervene, I would intervene with an essential oil or a 25B exempted product. But we have to remember that just because a product is natural or organic does not mean it's out without harm and without disruption. So I could take something as simple as cedar oil. And if I introduce it into a turf system to kill a grub, it will kill the grub for me very nicely. And I don't need that imidacloprid put down there, the neonicotinoid back in the early spring. But I know that cedar oil is going to disrupt my system. So do I want to do that at first out of the gate? No. And I'm going to show you some pictures where we identified grubs and we left them there. And we let the system control the grubs. If we choose to intervene with allowed materials, you have to embrace the concept of IPM. You have to go through all of these good 
horticultural practices and soil building inputs before we ever consider even reaching for the most benign material. We need to manage to communicate it expectations. So in other words, when we're training the industry to manage properties organically, it's not like there's just one organic program, like there's one four-step program, but we can manage to whatever communicated levels we have. So there's low expectations and there's high expectations. High expectation would be 5% minus weed pressure, like a, a high profile sports field, like that high end residential. That being said, we need to redefine what expectations are. There's too much grass. I mean, what I get talking in audiences and I, I, I'm basically a grass guy and the first, one of the first comments out of my mouth is way too much grass out there. Some of it absolutely has to go away. But the bottom line is some will always remain and that grass that remains needs to be managed you know, non-chemically. Low expectations, low quality is not necessarily bad and high expectations and high quality is not necessarily good. We have to break out of that industry stamp that they've put on us that everything has to be this 100% monoculture of a non-native species. And that's a problem. And that's where we need to re-educate from the very basic level of the average homeowner that's going out and buying these products right up through, at the, and, and we're doing that with the National Park Service. We're talking about appropriate management. Is it appropriate to have 100% monoculture of bluegrass in a prairie in uh, Nebraska? Probably not. And we're having to have those frank discussions with them is you have to really rethink this kind of a landscape. Um, you know, again, you know, children and poisons don't mix when it comes to public spaces and playing fields, but that grass is always going to be there because we need that for that recreational opportunity. So there are cases to be made. If you have a lot of weeds in a surface like that, the sport may not play as well. Does it have to be 100% weed free? No, absolutely not. But there needs to be a reasonable expectation of how we manage. Uh, this is 100% organic property. This property has been organic since 2001. Uh, and and we, don't, we don't intervene. The system has been established to take care of things. Uh, another one, and a close-up, this has been managed naturally since 2006 when it was built. Does not mean organic does not translate to weeds, and that's one of the things. The conventional industry will tell us every day that organic does not work and that it is too expensive. Colleen addressed that. It's not that expensive. We can do it now, cost comparative. I can fertilize a lawn and do 1,000 square feet of, of, of sufficient nitrogen to make that grow with enough powder that's in the palm of my hand that cost me 50 cents because science has now been able to take, and it's an OMRI approved material where an insoluble soy protein, and we understand that nitrogen is a building block of amino acids and proteins, and they've been able to strip the amino acid out of this insoluble protein, and now I have an amino acid that's the same amino acids family that is being produced in photosynthesis and I can put it down at one or two tenths of a pound of nitrogen and get a big benefit. Cost 50 cents a thousand square feet, how can you go wrong? The conventional industry can't even match those kinds of prices so things are changing rapidly. Moving to other aspects of the landscape, again this is part of, of a turf system, of, a, of, a, of an extensive uh, ornamental planting, late season flat sunflowers, no chewing insect damage because the plant material that was chosen in this landscape is, to, is designed to encourage and create habitat for beneficials and the beneficials can create situations where the damaging insects are controlled uh, and that really is again at the foundation of organic land care. Just to show you some statistics, this is a fellow that I've trained. I, I do training programs. He's gone through the Connecticut NOFA training, very similar to the Oregon Tilt training. Uh, Chris Paul from Genesis Landscape in New Jersey. Uh, he went into organic landscape. He took some courses a couple of years ago because he was motivated. He, was, he understood there was a market niche out there that was growing because for the average service provider, it, revenue it, it is the big driving factor. He thought he could make some money, so he went to his first organic training, which happened to be with me. Um, he started talking about you know, different things or that, that he was exposed to, again, as, as Colleen talked about, microbes, beneficial uh, fungi, bacteria, nematodes, recycling grass clippings, not taking them away, talking about the biomass and nutrition and nitrogen through the biomass nutrient cycling, fixation of nitrogen, right plant, right place, all of those concepts, biodiversity, uh, soil food web. 
Uh, then you began to see a change, that organic land care is a way of thinking. It's almost a lifestyle change. When you're exposed to it, it opens up a whole new perspective. It's not simply a product substitution. It's a whole system. These are his slides, by the way, that he creates because he now works to educate uh, others. So he started to do things differently. Uh, went from revenue and bottom line to education and service. Educated himself and his employees and his customers. He went to a training in New Hampshire and, and with NOFA, uh, in New Jersey. So he kept going because what he says, every time I went, I learned a little bit more. Uh, the bottom line for him is he, over two years, he has reduced water consumption on his residential landscapes by 19 million gallons. Uh, he's turning on systems later, turning them off earlier, encouraging customers not to water unless needed, uh, less, less frequent, uh, actually trying to grow that root system down there, uh, understanding how things happen, soils aren't as compacted. He reduced the use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides by 65,000 plus pounds over 24 or two growing seasons. That's significant. Uh, he reduced the dumping of clippings by 600 cubic yards. The cubic yard of grass clippings is a full pickup truck. 600 pickup trucks full of grass clippings ended up back in the system, creating additional organic matter and, uh, and nitrogen being reintroduced into the system. Uh, grass seed, using the endophytic grasses, uh, reducing use of exotics and, and invasives, increased natives, eliminating 250,000 square feet of manicured turf, uh, reduced the use of dyed mulches. Those are horrible things. Don't ever get involved with those. So it was, was it profitable? Uh, for the two-year period here, his profit increased by 191% from the organic land care division. Um, so that is, uh, you know, that's what these guys really want to know. So the last couple of slides here, I'm going to show you just a little project. I run trial sites all around the country on some of my different projects. I think I've got projects now in 10 or 11 different states and, and looking at different regions of the country as, as you know, and, and actually growing grass. Um, Things we look at is appropriate grass species, the best cultivars, site preparation, appropriate nutrition, revised cultural practices, good soil health practices, site assessment and evaluation is absolutely the critical step in our own landscape as well as all of these big picture ones. Um, this is a thousand square feet of residential turf. Uh, it's the summer of 2012. It's pretty impacted uh, with, with weed issues here. Close up of the weeds, uh, right uh, down here, there's almost a monoculture of broadleaf weeds. So there is significant pressure. If we did an analysis of this, we would say that 70% of this was, was uh, weed pressure. Um, we looked at different mowing heights, at two inches, two and a half inches. Uh, three, actually, it's two, three, and four right there. Beware of compost. Uh, if you buy compost, you want to make sure that what you get is uh, is not problematic because you can get a lot of weed seed in here. This went through a proper composting process, but it was a municipal compost. But it, and it was stored in a yard where none of the weeds around the perimeter were managed. So they all came up, they went to seed, the weed seed blew on top of the compost, and it's a perfect germination medium, and that's what you get. Uh, so this, and look at this here, this is nutrient runoff from the compost pile. These were little weeds that were an inch and a half, two inches tall. Uh, in three weeks, this is a four foot fence. They grew that way. Significant nutrient in compost. We have to be aware of that. I know at NOFA, we're addressing that now with people that are talking about, you gotta be really careful with compost. Kentucky bluegrass is how aggressive it is. So again, choosing the right grass for the right place. Uh, up on the top, this is uh, clover mitigation with the uh, you know products, uh, iron chelates and, and salt-based products uh, that are very different than the old traditional herbicides. Again, clover is not a bad guy, but if the desire is to minimize big monocultures, there are products out there. Are they as effective as 2,4-D in the short term? No. But do they need to be? No. So we're not looking at eradication. Even the chemicals, even 2,4-D never eradicates. It only suppresses. So you can put 2,4-D in a clover patch, but if you wait 24 months, the clover's gonna come right back because it's part of a system. Uh, crabgrass and putting an OMRI-approved uh, material on crabgrass, some effect, not much, 
but again, it's not product centered. So we're not looking at that product as being that uh, situation. Grub pressures were identified in this as we came towards the end of the aug end of August, and this is in the Northeast. So here we actually did our monitoring, which is a good, you know, is what we're all teaching, and you've got to monitor before you use product. That's why there's absolutely this idea that you're going to put imidacloprid down there early in the season and create a toxic situation all season long is just such a flawed principle that you're going to put it there when you don't even know whether you have a grub or not. There are seven grubs per square foot here on the surface, and we decided to leave them. We're going to let the system manage them. Uh, then we ended up, uh, here is a weed up top that came in compost. Here is a dandelion being out-competed by a healthy turf grass system. Uh, this is an eight inch depth here with no mechanical aeration. Just the soil biomass has loosened that soil to the depth of eight inches. And there is the root down there that actually snapped off. Roots are down here 12 inches deep, non-irrigated site. Once in a while, we'd put a hose out there with a sprinkler and let it run for a few minutes but not any regular irrigation. And that's what we turned it into. You know, we got that way. I mean, this, this was a lawn, it was a funny situation. This is actually my front lawn of my dad's house. And I was playing with it. I, 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 I grow grass, I burn up grass, I kill grass, and then I grow it again and just try, that's how we learn. But what ended up happening on this one was I had played with it for a couple of years and by 1st of August, I decided that I had painted the house, the house looked great. I was done playing with these experiments. I'm going to just kill the lawn and I'll, I'll put out Kentucky bluegrass sod and I'll work on developing nutritional programs for bluegrass sod. So I cut the grass down to an inch, scalped it at 90 degrees, and I cut it every seven days to an inch at 90, 85, 90 degrees, trying to kill it. Went to, by Labor Day, it didn't want to die. <laughs> it was still green, albeit short. So I said, well, now I, all of a sudden this kinship for this grass came to the <laughs> forefront and I said, I've got to keep this thing, it won't die. And so that, what happened was I went from Labor Day, that picture was taken on the 12th of August. Six weeks later, that whole system came back. Nitrogen applied to that was only 2.45 pounds in, in, in a year. So everything was low dose. Again, close up, the, you know, the system has controlled you know, control the weeds and uh, manage it. So there, there it is as the, uh, you know, as the finished product uh, once we got to October. Organic or, you know, sustainable lawn care is doable. It's no longer cost prohibitive. Strategies and protocols for more effective nutrition with less. We have to be aware of that. We can no longer go around and throw through as much phosphorus and nitrogen as we have in the past. It's being regulated. Uh, I think 20 of the 50 states now have either legislation in place or pending uh, for nutrient reduction. We need to understand plant genetics. Uh, it's not just a program of opening bags and making applications, but there is some understanding to what we're doing and be, nope, my timer went off. Uh, <laughs> so actually I have two minutes ahead, so that's pretty good. Um, it's a, not, making a, not a program of opening bags, so we're creating and building a system Adopting good horticultural practices. I always encourage students that I teach to approach any part of the landscape as a grower of the grass, a grower of the landscape, because I'm a grower by trade. So I encourage them not to look at, you're the maintenance person or you're taking care of it. You're growing that landscape for a client, and that is your job. Trying to get it right from the beginning. If you get it right from the beginning, management after the fact is so much easier. Uh, at all levels, uh, from residential through sports turf, uh, construction on a, on a commercial or a big residential you know, homeowner association site, and even the National Park Service. They get it wrong from the beginning, and then you're struggling afterwards to try to get things right, and it costs 10 times as much money to try to correct after the fact if it, than if you'd have gotten it right from the very beginning. So in designing and building, we need to understand the system. There's a big disconnect right now in the conventional industry from designing a landscape as a landscape architecture perspective and then what's happening in management. Because in the landscape architecture, their training is all conventional and it's the assumption that we're going to use all kinds of chemicals to manage this after the fact. So now what we're trying to do is dial right back to that aspect of the industry. Uh, success can be experienced, uh, you know, if we, if we manage, create, and maintain the system, that's how we experience the success. 
Um, and I think for the whole, you know, for the last 20 years, I think most of my presentations, I closed with this slide. And, you know, it, it sort of, you know, sums it up that it's about children. It's about creating healthy environments where children live and play, whether it's our backyards or, you know, whether it's that park down the street or the sports field that they're playing on, you know, five, six, seven days a week during some seasons of the year. So, you know, that being said, um, you know, I think the goal of, of the three of us here today is to, you know, all in our own ways, you know, try to affect change in the marketplace, change out there and what's happening. And with everybody here, the exciting thing at the conference here and beyond pesticides is always been focused on being solution oriented. And, um, you know, I applaud you both because you are the solution. Thank you. I personally don't like it, and for a number of years I was really involved in that issue, and I had to take a step back from it because, you know, what we always said was organic sports fields are stronger and more durable than synthetic, I mean, than, than chemically managed sports fields because chemical managed has a shallow root system and organic deep. And then what happened is, you know, communities, I was going in as a speaker and a consultant, and then they tried to pin me in a corner and say that my organic grass was stronger than plastic. And so then my real focus is pesticide reduction, so I took a step back out of the synthetic, but no, there's no sensible reason to cover acreages with plastic. Oh, there's all kinds. The EPA said no for a long time, and just last year they retracted that. Yeah, they did. And they said, yes, there is some significant issue that we don't fully understand. But uh, so, yeah, there is issue. On, on your um, park programs that you're working on, who are you working with uh, in the government? We're working with the National IPM Coordinator, and it's based in Washington. Uh, Carol DeSalvo, and then uh, we actually are working on, on, an, on, on like a week week to basis with the Midwest Region Coordinator based in Omaha. And then I do have a couple things here that uh, I'll leave if anybody's interested. Um, I, at NOVA, uh, Organic Land Care uh, in uh, Connecticut, NOVA, uh, we've come up, we're trying again, trying to educate the industry. We have an organic fertilizer fact sheet because you still cannot go to any land-grant university in the United States and get an organic education. That's why what you're doing is so important. Uh, and I'll leave these up here. Yeah? Uh, so true, because our local land-grant college recommended a magister to our city. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what? <laughs> so um, on the Marblehead, um, like you said they have an organic land management policy. Our city's kind of going through that right now, and I was wondering, Oh, sure. We have it right online. Okay. Uh, if you go to our town website, marblehead.org, and click on the link for the Board of Health, because we did this as a health regulation, uh, the policy, which is now regulation, it's been strengthened to a health regulation, uh, is there at that, on, on that link in its entirety. It's actually, it's been replicated. Yeah, it, it actually has been replicated a lot around the country, yeah. Yes. So how do you control the water if, if you've got water that's run off the, in Mexico you have safety. So they throw the French lands and the King Lake, whatever's in there, then you water your lands with safety water. What's the game? I'm not sure I understand. Uh, you, you've got, you're in New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the water ditch. It's oh, okay. It's the system of, of water issues. So, you have organic fields if you're watering with water with, that with well that's yeah I mean that those systems yeah there would be issues with those and that's one of those things that you know when our standards we would look at and that would be you know problematic that you know because you don't know what's in there and in many cases it can be just as as, as intense as making an application of something um, the idea I think that we try to do is that uh, you know, is to create systems that are less dependent upon water. And that's, you know, and would you agree with that, Colleen? Yeah, my first instinct was, unless you're using the water for your vegetable, edible home garden, 
you really should design a garden that doesn't rely on water, especially in the desert. Sure. I mean, you know, Mar Malibu, when I'm working out there, it's such a, a Mediterranean, an arid climate. And, you know, that's one of the, it, it's not appropriate to have a high water use landscape, you know, or to go down into some of those southwestern regions and expect to have golf course environments. It's just, and that's part of the education. That's part of the education at that level that this, I, I run this out in, in, back on the East Coast off of Massachusetts. We have two islands, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. And uh, I work on both of those. And they have these big, rolling, gorgeous, lush lawns right down to the ocean on Land Nantucket, you know, that go along with a $12 million house. <laughs> My point to them is if you want that kind of lawn, you have no business living in that coastal environment on the ocean on Nantucket. If you want that, go somewhere else. If you're on this kind of a landscape, you need to be appropriate to the, to the environment. Also, I want to say that we had our conference in Albuquerque last year. New Mexico and I love the organic farmers and the uh, Hispanic Indian the older guys that were talking to us and they said with great glee that we're the poorest state in the country we have the lowest SAT scores we have the lowest income per capita of the whole country and we're so far behind we've never been able to afford pesticides or any of the newfangled technology and we're so far behind now we are cutting edge and we're in the very front. <laughs> and I just love that. So hopefully you're in one of those. And also they have never disconnected the water rights from the land. So cutting edge, you guys are way ahead now. Anything else for Chip? Terry? Do you, do you talk that fast for eight hours? <laughs> You know, actually, I do because I, if I try to get like 12 hours into eight. And, but, but the biggest challenge you're ever going to see in my life is later on this afternoon when I have 11.75 minutes <laughs> to wrap up the big picture discussion. So, well, it's, it's, actually, um, my other question had to do with you, you didn't talk about overseeding here, but um, in the past you said that overseeding is the best way to approach a lot of weed problems. Yeah. And I was just wondering about my yeah, there is no, I mean, it, that's one of the problems right now that all, all grass seed in the country is conventionally grown and then pre-treated with fungicides. So what we have to do is every time we use it, we understand that going into it and we develop trend. I mean, it's part of the calling with the perfect with it is the transitional program that comes in. Uh, because we still yet cannot get untreated, uh, untreated seed uh, for the major, you know, the major base of genetics that's out there in the market. Um, just curious, uh, this policy for Marblehead, um, we have, our city owns a golf course, and it is in a watershed. So I was wondering, is, um, does, would it encompass something like that, this policy? A lot, well, the, yeah, there wasn't a golf course in Marblehead on public land, so that wasn't in there. Some policies that have uh, dealt with a golf course, they, and, and in Canada this happened, they exempted golf course from restriction and regulation. But yet out on Martha's Vineyard, there's a golf course that they wanted to build, and the actual, the, 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 the Martha's Vineyard Council said, you can build a golf course there, but you can't use any chemicals. So that it has to be naturally managed, and whatever happens, happens. So that it was built with the stipulation that there would be no chemical use. Uh -huh. So it worked. Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely, it can work. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Chip. Nobody can articulate this like Chip. He's a wonderful oh. teacher. He has so much knowledge, and he's a great guy. And thank you, Chip, and thank Thanks, you. Honey. And like I said, we must have people like you everywhere. Uh, Melissa is the grassroots person on the ground doing it, leading the neighborhoods and Colleen is training the people to do it and Chip has all the knowledge and helps everybody and set standards and we have to have the politician setting policy and uh, the, the research, we have to have the research to show people and prove to other people because they need to be proved to all the time. So we need all of that and everybody's doing it all at the same time and that's what we have to have. But it is pretty exciting with examples like this and what a great team and thank you for coming and it's time for lunch. And if there are more questions here, you can ask while we're walking back to the lunchroom. Thank you.